Hello everyone! Friends, the video you will see later was filmed back in the summer of 21, but I found the material monotonous and decided not to post it, just like many others that have been gathering dust, for several years in the depths of my laptop. And please don't be too harsh on this video. I repeat, I haven't uploaded content for almost two years, and I had no intentions to, but an opportunity arose. I hope you enjoy watching. Hello everyone! It's been a long time since I made any kind of stun guns, a very long time especially from old junk. Previously I made stun guns from an old energy saving lamp, a printer, a xenon ignition block, and it seemed like it was time to wrap it up. But for the sake of completeness, today I will show a stun gun made from parts of an old TV. I'll say right away, the stun gun won't be very compact, but for the sake of simplicity you have to sacrifice something. So, if anyone wants to see the process of making a compact and powerful stun gun, I've made those too. Links will be in the description. So, first we need an old cathode ray tube TV from the 70s or 80s. If the TV is newer, it probably won't have a voltage multiplier inside. And that's exactly what we need. I will be assembling my stun gun from old Soviet TVs. Let me clarify right away, you might have to buy some components for this device separately, for example the battery. Obviously, you won't find batteries in TVs. After we've opened the TV, we immediately extract the voltage multiplier from it. Usually it's a UN927. This is the ready-made high voltage part of our future stun gun. There are no complications at all, since the multiplier is already assembled and securely sealed. The downside is the large size. In principle, smaller multipliers can be found in small TVs, but unfortunately, they are not suitable for our purposes. More precisely, the discharges from such a multiplier would not be intimidating at all. Additionally, compact and powerful multipliers can be assembled using these capacitors 5 kV, 2 and 2 nF, and on KC-106G diodes, they can be found in Soviet televisions. This is of course a more preferable option, as everything will be compact and powerful. But to get KC-106 diodes and similar ones, you need to disassemble a large multiplier, which is a long and tedious task considering it's completely encased. But I promised to show the simplest method. So let's take a ready-made, albeit bulky, multiplier. Next we wash and clean it and set it aside for now. Here by the way is the schematic of our stun gun. A step-up single-ended self-oscillating converter which increases the voltage from the batteries to a value above 1000 volts. This voltage then goes to our multiplier, and at its output we get a constant voltage of an even higher value. And this value will depend on how many turns of wire the transformer's secondary winding contains. Yes, in the schematic we have a transformer, and it's a high voltage one. And naturally it comes to mind to use an already prepared flyback transformer from the same TV. It is wound, filled with resin, and together with the multiplier, it represents a ready-made high-voltage converter. Technically, this is certainly possible if you don't care at all about the size and weight of the future device, and you're ready to end up with a sledgehammer and a stun gun in one package. But, there are also more compact flyback transformers. Again, they are used in small TVs, but this transformer can be wound, manually. I've shown how this is done multiple times, and for those who like to tinker, just watch those videos and you'll succeed. The core for this transformer can be taken, for example, from the input filter choke of the same TV. It is usually on a separate board, and first you need to deolder it, heat it in boiling water to weaken the glue between the core halves, and then carefully disassemble it. Next, remove the two factory windings from the frame as well as the plastic partition, and wind your own coils. As I already mentioned, the full winding process is available on the channel. But I promised that it would be as simple as possible, so I will use a ready-made line transformer type TV70P3. It is much more compact than its larger counterparts, and can be found in a number of Soviet portable televisions. It can be used as is, without any modifications, but it's preferable to slightly upgrade it, but more on that later. We also need a power switch and a non-latching button. You can find a switch in a television and a button as well in principle. A regular micro switch will be more than enough, but I will use a modern switch purely because of its small size. Any buttons and switches with a current of 3 amps or more will do. Next, an LED indicator with a limiting resistor. The channel switching block is helpful. 
here as it has LEDs. In the circuit, we have a single transistor, and it's a composite KT829, a pair of resistors with resistance from 3 to 3 and 6 kilo ohms, with the second one needing to be 1, what, and pulse. Diode in this case, it's a KD226, with any letter. The circuit could be assembled on a printed circuit board, but since there are only a couple of components, point-to-point -point wiring is just right. Now, let's proceed with assembling our device. The high voltage transformer has two coils. The one on the right is the high voltage coil, winding, and it's easy to distinguish because this winding has only two leads. The one on the left is completely removed, carefully sawed off with a hacksaw, and all the windings are removed along with the base and leaves. In the end we get a blank like this. Now, it's necessary to wind a new primary winding on the free part of the frame, and nothing needs to be done with the secondary winding. In our case, it's ready with decent insulation. An encapsulation for winding the collector and base windings I used. Insulated wires, again from televisions, the collector winding contains 10 turns of wire with a diameter from 0.7 to 1 millimeter, and the base winding has 15 to 18 turns of wire with a diameter of 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters. We wind both windings together, try to wind them neatly, unlike how I did it. The start of the winding can be marked, for example, with heat shrink tubing. Why do I have three wires of different colors in the end? The thing is, the length of the base winding wire was not enough, so I had to extend it. The color doesn't matter here. After winding, all you need to do is take the start of the base winding and connect it to the end of the collector winding. The start of the winding is indicated by dots on the diagram. Then connect everything according to the diagram and you can already test it. The circuit will work even with a single battery, but for greater effect we supply about 4 volts from a power supply and carefully check the inverter's operation. Everything is cool. Now connect the outputs of the secondary winding to our multiplier according to the picture. In this case, for this connection it is necessary to use high voltage wires with thick insulation. Such wires can be taken from the same multipliers, for example a wire with a suction cup at the end. Initially, I plan to power this shocker from a single lithium ion cell of the 18. 650 standard. But look how vigorously the device crackles if you simulate two batteries connected in series. 18650. Therefore, it was decided to increase the supply voltage by using two cells. The cells are regular, not high current. Taken from laptop batteries, the capacity of each cell is about 2 amp hours. The battery is complemented by a board with protection for a current of 5-10 amps, although the shocker from such a source will consume a current of no more than 2-2.5 amps. The transistor is attached to a heat sink. In my case, the role of the heat sink will be played by a fixing metal piece, which was taken from a line transformer. The fifth stage, our multiplier poses some danger because it lacks a discharge circuit. In other words, after disconnecting, the power, the capacitors of the multiplier will store a charge. If you touch the output, it will give quite a shock. Therefore, a high resistance discharge resistor with a resistance of 50 to 70 megaohms is connected in parallel to the output of the multiplier. In my case, this is a chain of six resistors connected in series, each with a resistance of 7.5 megaohms. The total resistance is 45 megaohms. As output electrodes, you can use prongs from a regular plug. I use guides from an old disk drive. They are metal. The casing. It was decided not to fuss too much with this and to encase the entire construction in epoxy. Resin, in the end, will get a robust dust moisture and shock resistant look. However, it's disposable. If something breaks, the shocker will go in the trash. You can make a proper casing. To start, I cut out templates from cardboard, then taped them and made a mold for casting. All gaps were first sealed with hot glue, and on top of it, glue B7000 or something similar. All switches, buttons, the power LED, and the charging port need to be thoroughly sealed. Otherwise, resin will get inside, and all the work will be for nothing. After placing the components in the mold, everything should also be. The gaps are carefully glued. This is very important. Next, we take the epoxy. In my case, it's Zerzinsk resin. We prepare a mixture of 10 parts resin in one part. Hardener. Let this mixture sit for about half an hour and then pour it into the mold. The resin should not 
be heated for quick, hardening so that all air bubbles have time to escape. Unfortunately, I don't have a vacuum set up at the moment, so the casting won't be perfect. After a day, the epoxy has crystallized and the mold can be removed. Naturally, the homemade mold isn't perfect and the finished product needs to be sanded. But I'm lazy, so I just lightly grind the sharp edges and that's it. The distance between the output electrodes in this case is large and there won't be an air breakdown. It's necessary to add the prongs with protective spark gaps or so-called whiskers, the distance between which is about 2 to 2.5 centimeters. These whiskers can be made from regular wire and solder to the main combat electrodes. This thing weighs quite a bit. Surprisingly, it also works. The shocker can be charged from any DC power source with a voltage of 8.4 volts with a charging current of no more than 1 to 1 and a half amperes. How to make a universal charger with current and voltage stabilization, current and voltage for lithium. Batteries I have already explained in this video. The link is in the description. Of course, in terms of practicality, this device is not great. It's heavy and bulky. It is suitable for self-defense. But as mentioned at the beginning, this video is created purely for informational purposes. I strongly advise against assembling and using this device as it may lead to legal issues. That's all from me. Don't forget to rate this video, share it on social media, and check out the description. There will be more details. Well, I'll say goodbye for now. As always, this was Kazyanov K with you, and until next time.